That's the time. I want them to get off the platform fast. So you got until 9-5. All right? Stand to your feet and greet this young, wonderful man of God. Pastor, Pastor Rich Martinez. Thank you. Got it? All right, good, 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 good. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, family. God bless you. It's so good to be with you. You, you may be seated. God bless. Um, such an honor to be here. Such an honor to be here with each and every one of you. And uh, praise God. So we'll just get this set up. And uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Gail. Uh, thank you, family. And uh, I think, do we have anybody? We have somebody here from our congregation. Uh, Brother Lenny, God bless you. God bless you. He's, he's come to support. Praise God. And I, I brought my best support, my precious wife, Marie. And uh, so stand up and let everybody see how beautiful you are. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, I'm so excited to be with you. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, we love you. Our church sends you their greetings all the way from Northvale. And what an honor and a privilege it is to be here. Uh, I came here almost 32 years ago uh, when I was 18 years old. And uh, so it's been a long journey. It's been a blessed journey. And I'm so happy. I feel like I've come into my promised land and not wandering around in the wilderness. Praise God. But uh, God has been good. He's been so uh, good to me and my family, and we're just so excited to be here. And I believe I have a word from the Lord for you, and I've always believed that if you ever step behind this pulpit, you better have a word from God. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Uh, we don't preach messages, we preach words. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, the title of my message for this evening is Exposing the Enemy. How many know that we are in a spiritual battle? Amen. Uh, we are in a battle in the realm of the spirit, and we are, while we live in the realm of the natural. So the Bible teaches that there are two realms, that there is a natural realm and there is a spiritual realm. And there are forces of darkness in the spiritual realm, and there are forces of good. There are angels from heaven, and there are demonic angels. And we get a glimpse of that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to talk to you this evening about how the enemy gains access into the believer's life. Not so much in the common areas such as sin. We all know that if you play around with sin, you're going to open the door to the enemy. But I'm talking about in very subtle, uncommon areas that sometimes believers open the door to the enemy, sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly. And so pray with me for just a moment. Father, we just thank you for your word. We just ask right now, Lord, that you will give us ears to hear, hearts to understand, and eyes to see, and the will to obey. Father, unfold to us through your precious Holy Spirit, your living word. Teach us through your precious spirit now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 6, if you will. Um, Paul, when he wrote this letter, he was writing it near towards the, the end of his life. In fact, it was about four or five years before he was executed under Nero's reign. Uh, he was executed Roman style. He was beheaded under Nero's reign. And, uh, but before he died, about four years prior, he wrote this beautiful letter, and it's a, it's, a, it's a real revelatory letter. So it's only six chapters long. The first three chapters talk about who we are in Christ, or what God has accomplished for us in Christ. And the last three chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6, teach us how to walk out who we are in Christ. In fact, the New Testament, in the New Testament alone, there are over 700 imperatives, meaning commands, Greek commands, of doing this, do that, 700. And in the letter to the Ephesians, there are over 30 imperatives, 30 commands, and they're all in chapter 4, 5, and 6. And so things such as walk as children of light, be more godlike, be kind one to another, children obey your parents, and so forth and so on. But when we get to chapter 6, Paul, it's almost as if Paul has saved the best for last. As if he's saying, if you don't hear anything that I'm going to share with you, hear this. And he ends this chapter with the adverb, finally. And he gets to this word and he says, finally, my brethren. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God, verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he tells them to take on the armor of God. I'm not here to talk about the armor of God. You can read that in your own time. But I want to draw your attention to a couple of things here because this is really important. Because a lot of times believers open the door to the devil and they don't realize that they're doing it. And the enemy seeks, above all and foremost, to gain entrance into your life by establishing a foothold, by establishing an open door, by yielding to certain sins, by yielding to the flesh. He wants to establish a foothold in your life, and he seeks to do that. And so this particular chapter right here in Ephesians chapter 6, this passage, he tells us, be strong in the Lord. Notice the text doesn't say to be strong in yourself. It says to be strong in the Lord because you're no match for the devil. You're no match for the enemy. So you got to be strong in Jesus. you got to be strong in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. The name, Jesus was highly exalted. He was not just exalted, he was highly exalted and given a name above every name that at that name every knee should bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And it, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that, that at that name, beings in heaven, beings in earth, and beings under the earth must bow to that name. And so he's been given a name, and it's at that name. And you have to be strong, not in yourself, but you have to be strong in the Lord. But not just, how do you do that? You be strong in using the name of Jesus. You use that name. It's been given to the church. In fact, if you go to Mark chapter 1, one of the first things that we see in Mark chapter 1 is when Jesus' ministry begins, the first thing that he does after he calls his disciples is he gives them authority. Actually, he gives, does it in Mark chapter 3, but in Mark chapter 1, he delivers a demoniac. He delivers a man in the synagogue of a spirit. That's the first thing, and the Bible says that they were in wonder at how he did this. And they looked at him and they said that, wow, we've never seen anybody do something like this. In fact, he's not like the scribes. He, no, this is a man who teaches with authority. They observed that he had authority. And so we see him deliver somebody from a spirit. But then if you go over to Mark chapter 3, it says that he called the 12 unto himself and he gave them authority to cast out devils. He gave it to the 12. But he doesn't stop there. you got to go over to, to Luke chapter 10 and the Bible says that he expanded his ministry. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says he called the 70 to himself and he sent them out two by two. He gave them authority. And the Bible says in chapter 10 around verse 17, 18, it says that the, the disciples, they came back. The 70 came back and says, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And then Jesus said, you know, don't rejoice that, you're, that the devils are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are in heaven. But he says, but I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And he says, I give unto you authority to tread and trample under serpents, over sc serpents and scorpions. And so he gives it to the 70, but he doesn't stop there. At the Great Commission, he tells the church, he says, all authority has been given unto me. Therefore, go into the world and preach the gospel. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not will be damned, he says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. So you can see a progression. He gives it to the 12, his authority. He gives it to the 70, and then he gives it to the church. And you exercise your authority over the enemy through the exalted name of Jesus. So use it. It's been given to you as a weapon. It's the precious name of Jesus. And so we have to learn how to use our authority. But sometimes... We don't always use it, and sometimes we unknowingly open the door to the enemy. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that this evening. And, but before I do that, let's just kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to get to my message in a moment. This is just my introduction. Verse 11 says, to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. How many know that our battle is not with one another? We're in a spiritual battle, friends. And he tells us what 
this battle looks like, where it's against principalities, powers, or authorities, rulers of the darkness of this world. And in the Greek, it actually says uh, dark world rulers. That's what it really says. And it's against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's in really like outer space. You know, there's three heavens. There's the atmospheric heaven, there's space, and then the third heaven is where God resides. Those spiritual wickedness in high places, those are demonic spirits in the, in the upper realms, so to speak. And so, but we have authority. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. How many know what's going on in Ukraine? How many know this is not just all natural? That some man somewhere did, just got up one day and just said, I'm going to go into Ukraine. No, I guarantee there are spiritual forces at work that have been influencing this man. I'm not trying to get political here, but I'm just telling you that, you know, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And I know for a fact that during COVID, this man was locked up for a long time, he won't let anybody in front of him for over f for 40 feet. He's isolated, and I have no doubt that he's been pondering things, and the enemy is right there. And we see a lot of this. You, you can go back to the book of Daniel, and you can see you know, forces and spiritual forces operating and working through different kings. And uh, Daniel had a glimpse into this with the prince of Persia and so forth and so on. So what you see happening and unfolding in the natural is a symptom, is only a symptom of something that's happening in the spiritual realm. I guarantee it. So your battle is not just in the natural. Your, your spouse is not your enemy. Your boss is not your enemy. Your neighbor is not your enemy. That's why it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And in the Greek, the word wrestle there denotes a wrestling match in the Greek games where they would wrestle with each other like a real wrestling match. And so that's what we're in. We're in a wrestling match. So look at verse 11 with me. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The, the wiles. What does that mean, the wiles? That's the Greek word methodia. It's where we get the word method from. It's actually, I don't want to get too technical here, but it's a compound word, which means it's two words put into one. Method, dia. Methods, and that word dia is trickery. Tricky methods. He says that we stand, that you might stand against the tricky methods of the devil. So he's tricky. He's got, he has plans. He has schemes. He has strategies. He has designs. He has tactics. Some translations use tactics and strategies and tricks and schemes. So he plots and he plans and he ultimately wants to gain a foothold in your life and he wants to pull you away from God. Ultimately. But ultimately what he would love for you to do is to turn your back on God so you can go to hell and take you to hell. That's what he would love to do. He wants to thwart the plan of God. But tonight, I want to expose him. And I want to show him, I want to show you how he operates. And I'm just going to use the, I'm going to give you just four things, just four tactics or tricky methods that the enemy uses to gain access into a believer's life. And I'm just going to use the acronym of BUST, B U S. -T. T, just four letters, it's really an acrostic, just basically each letter is just going to form a word, and we're going to bust the devil tonight, amen? We're going we're gonna to expose him, all right? So if you have a piece of paper or you want to put it in your phone, you can do that, so I'm going to give it to you, I'm just going to give you these four, and then I want to pray for you at the end. The first area that the enemy comes, now these are not common areas, all right? The first area is... He tries to get you to believe his lies. He tries to get you to agree with him, to try to get you to receive his lies. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Genesis chapter 3, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Genesis chapter 3. It's a passage that is familiar to all of us. Genesis 3, and let's look at verse Let's look at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Did you hear that? This is talking about Satan. It says subtle, crafty. He's a schemer. 
He's very crafty. More than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband, who was with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed the fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And then we know the rest of the story, that God came and confronted them, and so forth and so on. But right here is where sin was introduced into the human race. This is where man fell. This is where this is where original sin was birthed. I mean, original sin really goes back to Satan who had pride in him and he fell and so forth. But here he's coming because God has given the he has given man authority. He's given them authority. He has come and now he's trying to strip man of this authority, get them to sin and turn that authority back over to Sa- and turn it over to Satan so that he could rule and reign and that's exactly what they did. And that's why the Bible says that the devil is the god of this world. He wasn't always the God of this world. Now, thank God Jesus stripped him. Amen? He spoiled principalities and powers. And Jesus took that authority and he says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you go. Amen? But here I just want you to see something. So this woman, Eve, she partakes of the fruit. And the Bible says that, that, that she be, she, it's, it's as if she's just reasoning. See, God already told her and told Adam, don't, don't partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's as if God's saying, that's my tree. That belongs to me. You can, have, you can have access to any other tree, but don't you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That belongs to me. And the serpent, being crafty as he is, he challenges and says, did, did, God, really, did God really say that you shouldn't eat from it? But do do you see what the devil is doing? He's trying to get Adam and Eve, particularly the woman here, to get her thinking in agreement with himself. He's trying to get him to agree, to try to get get her to agree with him and to receive his lie. And she buys into it. The Bible says she was deceived. The man was not deceived. The Bible says that. He was not deceived, but he was with her. And she took that fruit and she gave it to him. And and thus man fell. And man became subject to Satan at that moment. And that's why you have all the chaos and all of the craziness going on in the world because of the sin. And that's why God had to send Jesus. In fact, if you read later on, this isn't in in my message, but if you read later on when God confronted the serpent, He said to the serpent, he said that I'm going to raise up a seed from a woman who's going to bruise your head, who's going to crush your head, and you'll bruise his heel. He was talking about Jesus, Genesis 3.15. Actually, scholars call that the first gospel, the proto-angelion, the first gospel. That was the first good news that God announced in in the book of Genesis, that God would raise up a seed from the woman. And that was ultimately Jesus, right? Anyway, I won't go too deep into this. But, but I want you to see something. And I want you to see the fact that the enemy tries to pull people into his line of thinking. And what he does is he does it through suggestions. He brings suggestions. And he brings out lies. And he does it, and he does it with you. He does it with me. In fact... He'll tell you a lie such as, if God was really good, why did he allow this to happen? If God really loved you, why did he allow this to happen to you? And he tells you these lies. But friends, you gotta you gotta defeat and you gotta combat the devil with the word of God. You gotta be like Jesus. It is written. You see, Jesus didn't play games with the devil. He didn't have a he didn't have a, 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 a conversation with him. He didn't didn't play around. The devil said to Jesus on the temptation mount, if you're the son of God, turn these stones to bread. 
And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Isn't it ironic that Jesus, the Bible says, Pastor, that he's, he's the last Adam? And the same temptation that he tried with Adam and Eve with food, the very first temptation we read about was food with Jesus. If you're the son of God, turn these stones to bread. You know, maybe thinking, hey, I got the first one to fall through this fruit tree. I'll get this one to fall, turn it into bread. But he couldn't do it because Jesus stayed on the word. As long as you stay on the word, you keep your mind renewed to the word of God. The devil has no, he has no, he has no offense against the best defense, the word of God. He has, he has none. And this actually is more than a defense. It's a sword of the spirit. It is an offensive weapon. And you jab it into him. And he tells you that, oh, God doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. You tell him, it is written. God loves me. You tell him, if God be for me, who can be against me? You give him the word. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Sometimes he might come and he might whisper, you can never be forgiven for what you did. How about that? That's another lie of the enemy. And see, friends, if you believe these lies and you receive them, it's going to get in you. It's going, to be, it's, going to, it's going to hurt you. It's going to pull you down. And that's ultimately what he wants to do. He wants, he wants to get you to believe his lies. And you have to know that there's nothing that you could do that God would not forgive. 1 John 1, 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you have, to, you have to know that God loves you and that he forgives you and that, he, that even if you fall, you can ask him to forgive you and say, Father, I have sinned. Forgive me. Cleanse me. And he will do it by his grace, by his love. Sometimes he might tell you, the enemy might say, nobody loves me. Try to get you to feel sorry for yourself. Try to get you to, to just have a, a, a pity party. tell a little parable there was a the parable of the devil's yard sale I don't know if you've ever heard that before and one day the devil had a yard sale and there were all of these tools that he was selling and it was a big sale it was just big yard sale and he had this tool and he had that tool and and there was a big crowd that came and but there was off in the distance there was one tool that had a no for sale sign on it not for sale and one man got up and he said, devil, he said, why, what is that and why isn't it for sale? And the devil said, I can do without my other tools, but not this one. It is the most useful tool that I have. It is called discouragement. And with it, I can find my way into hearts that would otherwise be unreachable. When I can get this tool into a person's heart, it opens the way for me to put anything else in there that I want. Discouragement. Friends, do you know that every year for over 47,000 people commit suicide? You think they just woke up one day and just said, oh, I'm going to commit suicide? No, it started with a thought. It started with a seed. A little thought. And they begin to ponder it and ponder it. Over 47,000 people they say that there are over 1.3 million attempts of suicide per year. That's astounding. It shouldn't be. 130 people die per day from suicide. When you woke up today to this moment right now, over 100 people committed suicide around the world. You don't think the devil's working? You don't think he's planting seeds and, putting, and trying to plot and, put, and, 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 and plan? Because he wants to bring his will to pass, which is to pull you down. The Bible says that he comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give life and to give it more abundantly. But friends, what you feed on, what you're thinking about, is going to get it, eventually is going to get in your heart. And if it gets in your heart, you're going to act on it. I guarantee it. So friends, you've got to be careful. You've got to... You gotta stand on the word. You gotta use the name of Jesus. You gotta use your authority. Jesus said, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. You get these thoughts in your mind, you say, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I take authority over my mind. 
As Pastor always says, my mind was given to me to serve me, not to rule me. So you, you can't stop, Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, once said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head. But you don't have to let them build a nest in your head. You can't stop thoughts from coming, but you don't have to receive them when they do come. Thoughts that die, un, that, thoughts that die unacted upon die unborn. Learn to get into the Word of God until the Word of God gets inside you. Let it become a part of you. Friends, the only part of this Word that will do you any good is the part that you get on the inside. Store up the Scriptures for a day when you need them. And then when you're going through something, God can quicken it and it can become a rhema in that moment. And it, begins, it is written! And you speak it out. And you jab that sword of the Spirit right into the enemy. So friends, don't believe the enemy's lies when he comes. Number two, another area that the enemy comes to seek access into your life is unforgiveness and strife. And I'm sorry, friends, but you can't bind this one. You can't use, you can't use binding and loosing on this. You can't tell it in Jesus' name, I bind you. You've got to release. <laughs> you know why you can't bind? Because when you're holding something against somebody, you're bound up. A bound person cannot bind anything. I can't, if I'm bound up, I got nothing to bind you with. I'm holding on to something. Someone's got something against me. I'm holding on. I can't do it. But when I release them and I say, Lord, I forgive them. I loose them. I let them go. Now you're in a position to use your authority. So you see, the enemy works overtime to get you into, to get you into strife with your spouse, with your neighbor, with people on the road, people in the shop, right? People wherever. People in church try to get you into unforgiveness, try to get you into little resentments. Because it's, these are his wiles. These are his tricky methods. But friends, you, got, you can't fall for it. That's why Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Isn't it interesting that anger is in direct correlation to giving place to the devil here? Because when, you, when you're angry, he says, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, which basically means that you can be angry and not sin. You can, be righteous, you can have righteous indignation. That's okay. But if your anger festers and it's prolonged, that's what he means by don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That means if you, if you, if you go to bed and you don't deal with that issue with, between you and your spouse or somebody else and you let it fester, it grows. And when it grows, it gives place to the enemy. And the enemy knows that. In fact, the Apostle Paul was very well aware of this, Pastor. In 2 Corinthians 2.10, there was a, a man there who had sinned, but he was, he, he was restored. And the Bible says that it, Paul, when he wrote them, he says, look, if you forgive anyone, I do too. Verse 10. For what I have forgiven, I have, if I have forgiven anything, it is for you in the presence of Christ. He goes, I have done this so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes or his devices. So he knew that if he holds anything against this person who he doesn't even know, the devil will have an advantage. Friends, you got to let it go. you got to let go whatever somebody did to you. It's not worth holding on to. Friends, holding on to unforgiveness doesn't hurt the other person as much as it hurts you. Holding on to it, it doesn't derive any real satisfaction. It doesn't cost the other person anything. It costs you. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 18, do you remember the parable of the man who owed 10,000 talents and his master called him to account and said, hey man, you got to pay, you got to pay up. <laughs> the Bible says that he owed 10,000 talents to his master. Do you know how much that is today? $3.48 billion. That's how much he owed. And he says, I can't pay it. And his master had compassion, had pity on him, and he forgave him the whole debt. And yet that same man went out and found somebody who owed him far less than that and said, pay me what you owe. And he couldn't pay it. 
So he threw him into jail. And then the Bible says that the master found out about it. And he was upset. And he called him. He said, you wicked servant. He goes, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow servant, even as I have had mercy on you? His Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors. Who do you think the tormentors are? The devil. When you don't release somebody, you get delivered over to the tormentors. And then I don't even like reading this other part, but it's in the Bible. Jesus said, so my heavenly Father will also do to you if you do not each forgive your brother his trespasses from the heart. Because, friends, you see, forgiveness is like a coin. It has two sides. It has a forgiving side, forgiveness, and it has a releasing side, an extending forgiveness. See, one side of the coin, you receive forgiveness from Jesus because of your debt, your sin that you owe. And then God says, now I expect you to forgive everyone that's done you wrong, whether you like it or not, because I forgave you. And so that other side of the coin is you have to extend forgiveness. See, you receive forgiveness, but then God says, now I want you to extend forgiveness. It's two sides. It doesn't work one way. And friends, the only way that you're going to be free is if you release what the other person has done to you. At the end of the day, we must come to terms with what has happened to us, and we must forgive. And that, that doesn't mean that you have to be somebody's best friend. You can love them from a distance. But you need to forgive. That's the truth. If you hold on to it, I'm telling you, the enemy will get a foothold in your life. That's right. So be, watch it. Just watch it. So that's the you, unforgiveness. So we already talked about believing the enemy's lies, right? Now we're going to go into, then we talked about unforgiveness and strife. And there's other verses. I mean, I didn't even get into it, but James chapter 3 talks about, how, how, it says that we're, there is bitter envy and strife. It says that this here, bitter envy and strife, is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Devilish. I'm telling you, all this stuff, strife, unforgiveness, it, it lends itself to opening the door to the enemy. Don't open the door. And if you have, close it by forgiving whoever did you wrong. Number three, this is the S. This is another way that we open the door to the enemy. Sorcery and witchcraft. Now, you might say, well, Pastor Rich, I mean, that sounds so obvious and all of that. Oh, you'd be surprised what Christians allow into their home. You'd be very surprised. You'd be very, very surprised. Before I got saved, I was involved in witchcraft. This is when I was 17, 16, 17, all the way up until I got saved until I was 18. I used to practice astral projection. I was involved in New Age. I was involved in spell casting. I was involved in it. I had spirits that would visit me in the nighttime, appear to me as a, gu a spiritual guide of a, like, old men appear to me in my dream state. And it was so vivid and so real. And I was just like, whoa. And it literally scared the living daylights out of me. I stopped playing with that stuff. Because I, I didn't know at the time that it was, you were playing with demonic things. In fact, my first experience with the demonic realm when I, after I got saved, happened in the late summer of 1990, when I was in, I was, I had just come here in February of 1990, and I had signed up, prior to getting saved, I had signed up with the Army, with the National Guard, and I was getting ready to deploy in August, in August of 1990, and so I was here for just a couple of months, and when it came time for me to deploy, I was going to military police school. In 1990, August 13th, I was set to deploy. Saddam Hussein invades Iraq on August 2nd of 1990. I get deployed into the Army basic training and military police school on August 13th. Friends, when I got off that bus, from the time I got off that bus to the time I was there for 40 days, and I would, during that time, because I didn't finish, I actually ended up getting out early. I didn't want to be there because I God had done a, a work in my heart. I had gotten born again. I was filled with the Spirit. When I got there, I was like, what am I doing here? I had no desire to be there at all because I had signed up before I got saved. So when I was saved and I got there, I was like a totally different person. And when I tell you 
they put fear in us like you would not believe. All they kept drilling into us was, you're going to get trained and you're going to war. You're going to go fight Saddam Hussein because he's invaded Kuwait. I'll tell you, the fear that came over me was nothing like I had ever experienced before. And I'm telling you right now, it, was, it brought such anguish and it brought such turmoil to my mind that I, I could barely sleep. And one night I was laying there in my bunk bed. I was on the bottom bunk bed, and I still remember the time. I looked at my watch when this episode, this incident happened. 4.28 a.m. in the morning, right before the, the bell was about to ring, the buzzer to get up to do our uh, physical training. I'm laying there under the covers, and I'm, my leg is like this, and I'm, imagine if I'm laying flat on my back, and I have the covers up like this, and all of a sudden I feel something on my leg. This is my first experience with the demonic realm. I feel something on my, as a believer, I feel this, uh, like a hand on my leg, and I go to open my eyes like that, and I'm laying there, and it was as if my eyes stayed shut, but it was like a second sh set of eyes went... <laughs> Like, a, like shutters. Went, and I saw into the realm of the spirit. And I saw the most ugliest looking creature staring at me with his hand on my leg. And it noticed me that I had seen him. And when it saw me, it jumped back like that. And it was staring at me. I could hear it breathing. I could see it. It, had, it was hairy. It was ugly looking, greenish looking. It looked like it had elephant hair. When you look at an elephant from a distance, it doesn't look like it has hair until you get up close and you see all this hair. It looked just like that on his, the texture of his body, his eyes, everything. And I, now I wish I could tell you that I rose up in boldness with the name of Jesus and said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. And friends, the worst fear came all over me. My first thought was, God, why are you allowing me to see this? And I'm not going to lie, I, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed. But I took those covers, and I was in like a trance because I could bear, I was a little, not paralyzed, but I was like, I, I believe God was wanting me to see this. And I, and I took those covers, and I'm looking at him, and I went like this. And I put them up over my head, and I closed my eyes, and I just shook out of it. And I put them back down, and it, nothing. I believe the Lord was trying to show me that this was the reason you're being tormented. Because, you have, because there's, a, there's a spirit of fear. There's a spirit, there's a spirit that, that has come to harass you and torment you and to bring you into anguish. That was my first real experience with the demonic realm. Now, thank God, since then, I've learned who I am in Christ. Amen. And that we have authority. Amen? So you don't have to be as scared of them. You don't have to be scared of them. In fact, they're more scared of you than you are of them if you know who you are in Christ. If you know your authority. I still remember uh, Bill Weiss in 23 Minutes to Hell. And when he went down into hell and he got to see it, um, he said he overheard conversations with demons and they were talking amongst themselves. And he said he heard this one conversation. He says that they were saying about how they're going to plot and plan and go into all these homes and wreak havoc. And lo and behold, one of them says, but be careful of the Christian homes because they have power to cast you out. <laughs> I love that. That we have authority, friends. And we can use that authority through the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, but you gotta, you got to just be careful. And you say, well, well, Pastor, what does it have to do with sorcery and witchcraft? And Well, I got off my subject for a little while there. But let me tell you, there's a lot of Christians who allow stuff into their home that they shouldn't be allowing. Things like Harry Potter, watch, letting their kids watch all this stuff. Watching all these crazy shows, all these crazy things. Friends, be careful what you allow your kids to watch. Because the, the Satan is very subtle. He's very crafty. He wants to tell you that, it, oh, it's just a little innocent little thing. And No, friends, it's demonic. It's witchcraft. If it's in your home, get it out. And let it go. Let it go. I, I wish I had more time. I'm, I'm, all, I'm all out of time. And the last one I wanted to give you, where the enemy tries to gain access is through your tongue, what you say, what you're speaking. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. you got to watch what you say. James chapter 3, right? We know the tongue is a little member, boasts great things. It says that the, it's a, it's a, it, your tongue is a fire, and it sets the whole course of your life on fire, and it is set on fire by hell. You ever read that in the CE version? 
It says this, the tongue is a, like a spark. It is an evil power that dirties the body and sets a person's entire life with, on fire with flames that come from hell itself. Why am I talking about this? Because, friends, what you say will give access to the enemy if it's not of God. If you speak things contrary to the word of God, the enemy will come for your words. And he will try to bring those things to pass. That's why you got to be careful that you don't sit there and sit, you know, say things like, oh, I'm never going to make it. I'll never be anything. Oh, I feel like I'm dying. I don't think, I, I, oh, you know, or here, here, here's a great one. Oh, I just had a senior moment. Oh, you know, you know, when you hit about 50 years old, you know, your mind starts to go. Knock that off. Stop that stuff. Say, no, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of the anointed one. You know, speak the word of God. I love Daniel chapter 10. I'm closing. And you all know this story where Daniel, he prays, he fasts for 21 days. And the, and the uh, angel says he broke through. And he says that I, he goes, I've been in spiritual battle. And he says, Michael, the prince, he says, he's come and he helped me. And now that I've come through and he says this, I love these words. He says, now I am come for your words. That's the only, in the Hebrew, that's exactly how it's written. For I have come for your words. Friends, when you speak the word of God, it charges the angels of heaven. And, they, and they, they act on behalf of the word of God. But when you speak negatively, and you speak trash, and you start talking you know, crosswise of the word of God, the enemy comes too for your words. So you've got to be careful, friends. You've got you to speak the word of the Lord. Amen? Stand to your feet. I'm, I'm done. Praise God. I want to just pray with you, and I, I want to just, I, I want to lead you in this prayer of deliverance, if I may. And we can all pray it together, and I want you to pray it with me. Because just in case you've opened up any doors at all in your life, I want us to shut them. Amen? Can we do that? Yes. Praise God. I want to lead you in this prayer. Say this with me. Pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father. I come into your holy presence by the blood of Jesus. I worship and honor you. Lord Jesus, I look to you as my Savior, my healer, my deliverer. I believe that God raised you from the dead. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I repent of all my sins. Lord, purify my heart. I receive now your grace your forgiveness, and your cleansing. And I choose to freely forgive anyone who has ever sinned against me or hurt me in any way. Now I want you to release that person's name. Call it, call it out between you and the Lord. Specifically, I forgive and then put their name in there. I release them to you and let go of all bitterness, anger, hatred, and resentment. And Lord, I completely sever myself from all contact that I have ever had with sorcery, witchcraft, or the occult. I renounce it in the name of Jesus. And I break the power of every negative word that I have ever spoken in Jesus' name. And I break the power of every negative word ever spoken over me in the name of Jesus. And Father God, I align myself with you and I submit myself to you. Now Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I come against every foul spirit that is working against me. I command you to desist in your maneuvers against me. I break your power over me in the name of Jesus. I cancel your assignment against me. I bind you in the name of Jesus. And I command you to go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now just say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Amen. Praise God. God bless you, family. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Give the Lord some praise. Amen. Amen. Good, 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 good. good. Stand to your feet.
Before we go, I want you to do me a favor. Just lift your hands and ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me now? See, before we go, God wants to say something to you. Now that you have heard what this beautiful young man ministered on, we need to just, before we go, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me? sometimes you know when we, we, get, we get done preaching and stuff like that and especially when when we confess something that someone is asking us to confess which is great we're not really you know we're not giving the Holy Ghost just a moment to just what are you now saying what are you saying to me he, maybe he wants to put his finger on something that was preached so that you can really get this thing right, so that it works. Whatever he preached, it's going to work for you. So let's lift our hands for a moment. Anybody, see, because see, I, you know, when you sit